when that happens, I'm sure you're thinking, oh my God, this must be the greatest person in your life. <laughs> so 1977, best-selling novelist, 32 years old. Somebody options uh, his best-selling novels for a film. Contracts are signed. He is sent to the Middle East Hotel. He goes into a meeting. The meeting is two hours long. It uses all kinds of words he's never heard before. <laughs> he's not quite sure what he should do after he leaves the meeting, but he is told that he's got to write some sort of a scenario or outline or something like that. And he can do that. He's been doing that since high school, even though back at the Beverly Hills Hotel, the typewriter they gave him is this white Olivetti with blue ink, last used by Kim Novak to write thank you cards. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> true story. Um, so what happens is, as he's leaving the office and about to go to lunch with one of the big producers to somewhere else, um, he, nobody's looking at him and he swipes a screenplay and he stuffs it in his bag, and that's what he's gonna be working from. Why does he stuff a screenplay? Because he's never seen one before in his life. Not like nowadays, where you can go to the library and get them, or go to Barnes and Noble and get them. He's never seen a screenplay in his life. He has no idea what it looks like. He has no idea what's required of him. Does he have to write screen, you know, selections? Does he have to say, you know, Colored lights here, black and white here, whatever. No clue, right? So this was me in 1977. And little by little, whatever I did seemed to work. Even though the movies never got done, I got more and more work. At one point in the early, in the middle of the 1990s, myself and Carrie Fisher were the two best script doctors in Hollywood. <laughs> Very highly paid. We would call each other up and say, did, did they send that awful thing to me? <laughs> and she'd say, oh my God, I'm not, I, I'm gonna say I never received it. <laughs> That's what it was like. To help you not feel that way, to give you some idea of what actually is taking place, at least uh, in terms of doing some writing, Developing your story for stage and screen, formats, hints, and secrets, I developed this. There is a book <laughs> called Justify My Sins, a Hollywood novel in three acts, which will tell you about all the other stuff. <laughs> the crazy actresses, the producers who don't know what they're doing, um, what you do when that happens, what you can get away with, and uh, this is for sale upstairs. It just it, today is the uh, publication day. Oh, oh. Well, <laughs> so okay, let's see if this is going to work now. Okay, that's me. You've seen me. <laughs> Basic <laughs> tools. Which you now feel free to ask questions as we're going along, because this might get complicated. Is yes. it okay if I take pictures of the screen? I'm sorry. Is it okay if I take pictures? Uh, yeah, everything here is, all the pictures here are available. The promotion departments of the film studios make them available. What you do with it later, I don't know. <laughs> okay, and that might be a copyright issue. But you can take pictures of it, yeah. So basic tools you'll need to work on, um, and, and we'll discuss this a little bit as we go on. A log line one pager. Does anyone have a clue what that is? Okay, you'll see. Do you know? Well, a log line, I've, I've written this couple of lines, but a log line one pager I made is just a summary, synopsis. Very good. Based, right. synopsis. But the log line, and we'll look into the log line a little bit later, the log line says a variety of things. Hi, Chris. Hey. Come sit. Um, the log <laughs> line has, uh, says, uh, number one, the genre that it's in, because, you know, they're not brilliant literary people. Yeah. <laughs> so you really have to clue them into what's going on. So let's do some other basic things here. A one or two page summary of the main characters and subjects of the story. So if you're doing something like The Godfather, it would be The Mafia, The Untold Story, etc., etc. That's the subject. 
and then eventually a full script between 90 to 120 pages long formatted correctly, and I'll show you that later. The reason why it's 90 to 120 pages is because each page of the script is, or actually, it's not that each page is one minute time, but about five pages of dialogue and action is five minutes on the screen. So you can tell how long your movie's gonna be, and if it's longer than 120 minutes, you better be Francis Ford Coppola, because they're not gonna look at it. Right? So you want it to be about two hours. Right? And the length of your screenplay will do that. Show you that. <coughs> Plotting. Again, we're simplifying, and you can simplify. Basic types, the central character wins, you see Superman, the central character loses. Really simple, not very difficult. But a lot of people don't, don't actually get it, so this is why I'm putting it here. The central, no, again, plotting. The central character sows the seeds of his own destruction. And I gave us uh, some ideas, Bonnie and Clyde, they go on this crime spree, crime doesn't pay, they end up dead. Moby Dick, this crazy captain, goes after the, goes after Moby Dick and everybody ends up in the sea or dead or something. So the central character shows, shows the scenes, his own destruction. In this case, it is um, a movie called They Ride by Night, They Drive by Night, and it's a noir movie, do you know what noir is? It's sort of the dark mystery thrillers uh, of Hollywood post-war World War II, which people have been making ever since then. And here he's in love with this woman. She's, quote, no good, and therefore she's going to destroy him. This is not brain science here. The central character learns a lesson. <laughs> Wizard of Oz, there's no place like home. <laughs> Central character does the right thing and grows up. Groundhog Day is a perfect example of this because he literally has to do it over and over and over again. But uh, My Best Friend's Wedding is a, a, another very good example of it because she goes into it with one whole set of goals and by the end of the movie, that's all been turned around. So a basic plot, uh, is the character doing the right thing or figuring it out to do the right thing? <coughs> Plotting, the central character grows up. The Godfather is a great example of that. By the end, you know, Michael goes into this movie saying, I'm not gonna have anything to do with this family, blah, blah, blah. At the end, he's just had somebody off and he's the Godfather. It happened to him. La La Land is a perfect example, and why it's a much better movie than people think it is, if you see it a second time, is that it really does show the reality of this blazingly romantic relationship, which can't work, right? It just can't work. So they grow up, the two of them. Movie genres, I mentioned genres before. A lot of this stuff you already know, and it's not that you don't know it, and I'm reminding you because when you're working with film or TV, they, they follow such you know, close rules that you have to remind yourself over and over again. I teach a uh, writing workshop in, out of the West Hollywood Public Library, which I've been doing for three and a half years, and I do three of them. One of them is fiction, one is nonfiction and memoir, and the third one is this one uh, for screen and stage. And people, I developed this actually for that. And I find it very useful. Okay, movie genres, science fiction, detective mystery, film noir, we saw it before, traveling angel or do-gooder. Does anybody remember what this is? What this scene is from? Hmm? It's the Earth is in stone. Yeah. No? Yeah. The, the, the original of the day the Earth stood still. It still holds up really, really well. Sometimes you can combine these. We're going to do a couple more, and you'll see that you can actually combine them. Elise, what's an example of the traveling angel? That's a little familiar one, I think. 
travel, what's an example of the traveling angel? Uh, there was, a, there's all kinds of movies, but the, the, the classic one, Michael is one, but the classic one is uh, The Bishop's Wife, where Cary Grant comes down from heaven, all right? There's the other one, which is the famous uh, Christmas movie, where there is, where he's got to, to he's committing suicide, yeah. and he's wonderful got life. to, wonderful life. Wonderful, life. wonderful life, where he's got to do it. These are traveling angel stories, right? There was a TV series which did the same thing. Right? And you can smoosh them together. Here's the biopic, which is what it is, the rom-com and the screwball comedy. Uh, here's um, Catherine Hepburn, at a moment in her <laughs> school. Structure. So those are the basic things. Let's go back a minute, because I really want to go back for a second and say what they are. The biopic, the rom-com, the screwball comedy. Oh, this is only Hindu. The love story, the action adventure, the thriller, the fish out of water, the horror story. Any of you see the Academy Award winner, The Shape of Water? Yeah. That was Love Story, Action Adventure, Fish Out of Water, <laughs> Possibly Horror. Yeah. And so when, it really was, it was a whole combination yeah. of these things. So when he was selling it to Hollywood, even though he's a, a, a very well-known director, I'm sure that's exactly what he put on his long run. It combines these four genres. So you can hit four audiences at once. So this makes a lot of sense. They spend a lot of money making movies. You know, They want to know one of the classic things about producers, they say, OK, this is a nice scene, and it's going to cost us a lot of money. Can we see all the money up on the screen? That's why there are all these ch car chases and helicopters going down. You know, if they, I'm going to buy a helicopter. I want to see it crash in time. Mm -hmm. So I know I spent the money Producers Let's go back again. Science fiction, detective, mystery, film noir, traveling angel, or Jupiter. One of the things that uh, made Alien, the original Alien, such a big hit was that it was really the first time that defect, science fiction, film noir, and horror were all combined. Right? If you can put together two or three genres in an interesting and original way, they're going to love it. They really are. Uh, it, it's not that difficult to do either. There used to be a classic uh, thing going around in Hollywood, which is Godzilla meets Bambi. <laughs> <laughs> and they actually made a two minute film out of it. You see Bambi dashing around and something that comes down. And stuff. Uh, <laughs> Godzilla uh, meets Bambi. Uh, <laughs> but, you could probably sell it, you know. Yeah. Structuring. Structuring a novel or a short story generally is pretty clear cut. Your story, it grows, it develops the structure as you're going along. The characters say different things. And finally, you have a short story, a short play, or a novel. In films, their structuring is also codified and um, it usually works in a very clear cut way. The first part of it is the backstory, an event or a series of events that happen before the story unfolds. It may haunt your main character, leading to a character flaw. Now, why do I have Laurel and Hardy here? The first movie that they put together, they weren't together, they meet within 15 minutes of the movie. And um, the way it develops is that Hardy has a business. He's got a uh, electrician's business, and he's working as an electrician. And Laurel comes in painting the house. He's a house painter painting the house. And he all but, between the two of them, they all but destroy the house. <laughs> so they go to a judge, and the judge, you know, they're taking a court. And the judge says, you've got to get this house back up. You've got to fix the house, and you've got to paint it to make it really beautiful. And you're going to work together. And that's how they started up. Right? So that is the event 
that happened before the story, the story unfolded, well, the big story, which is their relationship, um, but it's what sets things on edge. But as a rule, if you're following the arc of the movie, after the showdown and the pinch of the opposition and the crisis, that's when the realization comes. Oh my God, it's you know, Bruce, Bruce Willis sliding down that 75 story building. If I don't do this, I'll never get my wife and kid back. Yeah. And that's the realization of what he has to do. He looks over the side and says, ah, this is it. This is it. That's the realization. And then after the realization is the fade out or the last of the action. We don't lose the last scene we are left with. Now I'm going to go back and do these again. Do you have any questions on them before I do that? Yes. Yeah, can you talk about the difference between catalyst and a big event? You have to speak up. Um, oh, the difference between a catalyst and a big event? The, the catalyst and the big event? Clarify that the event. catalyst is, I, the example I gave was, we have to pick up grandma in the back of the car, Imogene Coca, right? It's not what we plan. We don't really like it, but it's not going to stop the trip happening. They take the trip, it's not going to end the action. The action in that movie, which was the family trip, was we're going on a family trip, and the family trip continues even though Imogene comes in the middle of it, or fairly close to the beginning. So the catalyst is an event like, let's say I'm crossing this to get to that because it's malfunctioning, and I trip on the wire but I catch myself, that's a catalyst, right? If that thing then falls into John's lap and sets his hair on fire, <laughs> that's the big event. <laughs> right, do you see the difference? I think so. The catalyst is something that sets the rest of it going, but it really is a small thing. In some things, you almost don't see it. There, uh, in um, horror movies, the way they're made nowadays, there's like five little catalysts. Right? And all of those little catalysts are there in a row, and you, have, you as the uh, viewer have to select which one is going to lead to the big event, and then who's going to be done in. Right? So there are all these little, so there are all these little clues put out. Yeah. I realize I'm doing this quickly, but I really... Okay, the big event is what changes your central character's life in a big way. It comes around page 30 or 20 or 30 of two hours, so it's about a half an hour in, right? And it is the big event in that once these guys see what has happened here, they have to go after the big events. They have no choice at this point. Right? It's a huge event, it changes everything. In, uh, let's go back to Alien again. In Alien, uh, the catalyst is they uh, get the, they, they're awakened. Right? Everything's, it's a quiet ship, everybody's asleep, melted here and cryo sleep or whatever it's called. And that's the balance. They are awakened, that's the catalyst. And then the reason for them being awakened is that there's this planet that somehow or other the company wants them to go to. They go down there, they're looking around, and this thing jumps onto John Hurt's face. That's the big event. I got it. Right? From that, all the other crap is going to happen on that ship. If he didn't look in there, no. oh, I know what's in there. Right? <laughs> <laughs> if he didn't do that, the rest of the movie wouldn't happen. Right? So that really is the big event. <laughs> well, maybe could you use Alien to go through the, the, the difference between the midpoint and the finish? Okay, let's go. Let's continue. I mean, actually, okay. That's the big event. Next is the midpoint of the pinch. In Alien, the midpoint of the pinch, I think, I mean, I don't know how they wrote it, but I think the midpoint of the pinch is people realize this crazy thing is running around eating people. Right? We got to do something about it. Right? Okay. So that's a pinch. It's like you're stuck in a, in a situation. In, um, my best friend's wedding, 
the pinch comes when Julia Roberts sees her ex-boyfriend's girlfriend, and she's a doll. She's sweet, she dresses right, she can't say anything bad about her, right? And she turns to Rupert Everett and she says, what do I do? What do I do in this situation? I've got to do something. So that was the, pin the pinch in her, in her movie, right? And if you remember, what she does is, they're all uh, hanging around afterwards, and she gets you to do karaoke. Uh -huh. You remember that scene? And Cameron, Co uh, uh, Cameron Diaz, who's sweet and pretty and you know, seems like one, comes up to him and competes. She stands up to it. She sings the karaoke. Everybody applauds. And uh, poor Julia is back where she started. Mm -hmm. And back where she started is the bench. That leads to a crisis. Yes? Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm the, uh, the uh, android robot lets her know, as she figures out, that she lets her know, Sigourney Weaver know, that this was, they knew what they were going after. The company. The company knew what they were, the corporation knew what they were going after because it was a killing machine. The message that they got was, stop at this planet and pick up this killing machine because the company wants it. And when she finds that out, it's like, wait a minute. And there's only what, three of them left at that point? You know? This is, you know, it's, it's I call it the deep shit moment. <laughs> right? This really is, again, it is like, what are you going to do now? You are this deep in it. Right? And it has to come after the pinch because the pinch is what makes it happen. It solidifies it. Right? Okay. So this forces a crucial decision. And in the case of Ellie, to go back to that, her crucial decision is, well, you know, screw all these people. It's me and my cat. And we're going to either <laughs> escape or kill this thing. Right? And that's why she's the hero. Okay. She really does understand what's going on, figures out where she stands, and takes the stand. Sometimes, though, in like screwball comedies, it's the low point. Although I really think that there was a school of comedy with um, Catherine Hepburn and uh, bringing up baby Catherine Hepburn mm -hmm. and um, Cary Grant, where she's putting to the, the last piece of the dinosaur. Yeah. 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 Remember that? <laughs> And it all collapses. Right? And at that moment, you got a visual idea of the crisis. And one of the interesting things about movies is a lot of times you can do a very dramatic and very visual stunt, and that forms a, a crisis in a way that nothing else really does. It makes it, it brings it home. And the showdown and climax. If you are committed to a way of action, she's now got to fight the alien on her own terms. She sets up the ship to blow up, and she's going to get away. She and the cat is going to get away. That is the showdown. We see her doing all these things and running through the ship, and she doesn't know if it's coming, and she's chasing her. And then, uh, it's the final fight for that. Then the realization, and her realization is she gets on onto her little escape pod. The ship is blown up, right? And she realizes that this thing is hanging on to the escape pod. Yeah. So it's not going to be that easy to get rid of it, right? Okay. So she has to do something. Even after that, she's got to do something. 
sequel. <laughs> I think the cat should have gotten the cat. <laughs> the cat was great. I mean, in general, I like cats, and when they're in movies, they're pretty good. But that one was really used on a cat. <laughs> and then the fade out. She succeeds. She freezes herself in the cat, and they go up into the blue set or whatever. Okay, so this is pretty much an art. Right? And a lot of times you will be writing something, you'll write a story, and you could literally write it in three acts, which is why this book is called The Hollywood Novel in three acts. It works in three acts, because that's what they understand. And why is it in three acts? And sometimes the last act is seven minutes long, right? And why is it in three acts? Because film is a takeoff of the stage plays. And by the early part of the 20th century, stage plays were no longer the five actors that uh, Shakespeare was putting on, but they had come down to three acts. And, you know, Gilmas really sort of grew out of the stage. A lot of the early actors were from stage works, especially in England and England old. There was a lot of moving back and forth between uh, stage plays and screenplays and movies. So it took that out. It is a three-act thing. Sometimes the first act is the entire first hour, right to the pinch, where you do all of the setup, all your characters are introduced. If they have foibles, they show all their foibles. You know who these people are inside out. The second act starts about an hour in, and that's when the action starts gearing off. And it gets to the point where literally something has to be done. Right? And then the third act is the guy's hanging by his fingertips. And he's got to he's got to finish off the movie. Right? Think of West so, Side Story. West, what? Side, West Side Story. West Side Story. You want to know what the three acts are? You know them, right? I do. I said I just reminded me of that. Could you talk about them for a sec? Can you tell us? Well, yeah, when they meet. Yeah. And uh, they can't end up. Uh, the friend is killed, and the two families are enemies, and then right. they fall in love, and he's singing on the balcony, etc. Then, when two families are against each other, they, they realize that this is not going to be allowed. And, of course, you know, uh, Chino's going to kill, uh, you know, uh, Tony, you know, Tony, Tony, Tony. etc. Et so then, it's the, the gang fight, and of course, the, you know, when they get married, the mom and all that. And then the last part is he's killed. Right. And then so there's a the classic three-act. Yeah. 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 I just. And if you look at if you go to the movies and look at them, I go I go with my watch. Yeah. <laughs> or with my phone. Yeah. And I literally time these things. I'm mean, enjoying the movie, and then I look. Oh, that must be the pitch. And, then I look, and sure enough, it's like you know, 54 minutes in, you know, or 57 minutes in. There was in the, uh, the mid 1990s. Um, I was asked to. But my my books have uh, been out in, in Germany a lot and been bestsellers. But I was asked by um, a film director and his wife, who did a lot of movies to come there and help them write an American film, mm. right? And what they needed was this type of format, which foreign movies generally don't fall. I mean, if you take La Dolce Vita, that maybe approximates it, but none of the other foreign movies do. You know, a lot of the foreign movies, and a lot of wonderful movies, don't fit it in. But increasingly, these directors were feeling under pressure to develop American-style movies for the world market. Mm -hmm. And so I was hired to help put them into some sort of order that would be comprehensible so that when a, a, an, an American or a world distributor got this movie and watched it, he can say, oh yeah, act one, act two, act three. That's the pinch, that's that, that's that. And a lot of times when both Carrie and I and other uh, script doctors are there and with these things are thrown at us to make something up, sometimes it's easy and all we have to do is rearrange the stuff into this type of law. Right? And once you've got the author, which doesn't always, 
<laughs> doesn't always work, but sometimes it works brilliantly. It's just that the writer did not really see it when they were putting it together. Right? But it's the only thing the producers see. Sometimes it's the only thing the actors see. I remember I've been in a meeting with an actor where you know, she would say, well, I really like this, but I don't really like what happens up to this moment of the pinch. Everything after that is fine. You know, can't we develop the character a little bit differently? So this is something you have to be clear about. These people really do. I think it was, uh, I can't remember who it was, James H. who said, a perfect screenplay is like an Elizabethan sonnet. It's very limited, very controlled, but you can do a great deal within this very tight piece of writing. And it really is like Elizabeth and Sana, it, you know, with a real bang at the end. Okay. Now let's move on to something else, which is your two main characters, and here we have Sigourney. Yes? A quick question. Um, does Act 3 begin, or does... Does the climax happen at the end of Act 2, or is that the beginning of Act 3? Where does that division fall? That is usually the showdown. It is, is which act, though? The crisis has happened before. Yeah. The crisis leads to a showdown. You're there. You know, King Kong has just has escaped, and he's climbing the Empire State Building, or wherever he's climbing, and that is the beginning of Act 3. There. OK, so Act 3 starts with that. Yeah. That big moment. It's going to wrap up. The, the action is going to wrap up from the beginning of Act Three, right? right? So that's going to be the whatever else happens there. That's going to be the last series of scenes you're going to you're going to be writing and you're going to be seeing in the movie, right? So a lot of times you want to make it as they say, pop up. You want a big blowout at the end. So here's your two main characters, and this would seem simple. Except people very seldom do it. So it bears uh, repeating. The central characters are often the protagonist or the good guy or the hero. He or she should always have a goal and be moving toward or away from something. Right? Now here's where film and television are different. Everything else that I've said so far about film can be set for TV. If you're writing a pilot, often it's a one hour or two hour pilot, it's going to read like a movie. The people who are in it say, yeah, we just made this movie, it's a pilot. Right? But over here, he or she should always have a goal, they should always have a goal, and should always be moving toward or away from something. And that's true, but in movies, it's solved. Right? Whatever the goal was is reached or semi-reached, and whatever the problem was is solved or sufficiently solved, and in a TV series that is not what happens. The idea is to keep it from being solved week after week after week after week. Right? And that's the main difference between the two. And so that you can have a wonderful story and you can go pitch it to someone and say, I have this wonderful idea for a TV series, and he can turn around and say, well, what are you talking about? It'll be solved by episode four. What else is going to happen? What's going to happen in five and six and seven and eight since you just solved it, right? So you have to keep that in mind that TV works differently that way. But all of them should be a goal and moving toward or away from something. In this case, they're all moving away from the giant aliens, this is aliens too, that we're moving away from the alien queen, right? Who's like everybody's nightmare come true. And she's trying to get the little girl and herself away from her. Your two main characters. Oh gee, look who showed up here. <laughs> Kevin Spacey. <laughs> the antagonist. So we had the good guy, has a goal, is moving towards something. And here's the antagonist who's determined to stop or hinder the central character. And in writing a screenplay, and even writing a, a, a TV series in your pilot, make it clear who or what is the antagonist. The antagonist could be like we have 
what I call uh, sweet dime teens movies. There are a whole series of sweet dime teens movies. The antagonist <laughs> is not the nurse or the bad doctor or anything. It's the disease. <coughs> Here I am, sweet. I just want to live to 18. And here's this disease coming at me. You know, that's the antagonist. So it doesn't have to be a, a person. He or she is either consciously or, and this is important, subconsciously, against the central character's goal. Um, long-running series with Ray Romano on television, and you know, I think the mother-in-law was the antagonist. <laughs> she was fabulous. She came up with one hassle after another. The imagination that was put into her was like, "This is I'm getting an enemy. This is the enemy. She's the villain." What is a log line? This is a log line. A log line. We need to break it down very, very carefully. Casting the rooms is the name of this movie. The genre is, in this case, historical sci-fi horror. Right? And you say what it is. It's a screenplay. And then you say where it came from. And you say, based on what I said, based on a classic short story by M.R. Jones. So I've told a potential producer or actor or director a whole bunch of things there. What have I told them? That's an established source, that people will recognize the source because right. I use the name of the, of right. the author. What tell else? Them what attracts the audience and what audience you're going for. Okay, what else? It's going to cost a certain analysis. amount of money because it's historical. Mm -hmm. So they're going to have to do costumes or scenes. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. But since it's based on a classic short story, they're not going to have to buy the material. Okay? Oh. Right? So in the one case, you're saying you're going to, it's going to cost money here, but you're getting that for free. Mm -hmm. It's not like buying the exorcist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's long dead. It's in the public domain. Right. So now here's the, so that was the genre. So you want to be as clear as possible in as few words as possible about what it is you're doing. And you know, when you're doing various pitches to um, editors and to publishers, this is really, really useful to know what your genre is, right? you say it up front, what it is. If you can put it on the front of the book like this, a Hollywood novel in 3X, it's right there. You know, no surprise when you open it up and it's a, you know, a Hollywood story. You know. So now the, you said a lot there. Now if the log line is the shortest possible description of the material inside what you're going to be writing. So let's break this down. In a picturesque 19th century New England town, two brothers and their friends, including the reclusive American poet Emily Dickinson, battle a powerful demonologist who controls and kills using the spells of ancient Icelandic runes. Now, let's say that as a producer or director or actor, I actually went to college, and at one point in my life, I read this classic story called Casting the Room, and I say to you, wait a minute, wait a minute, there was no Emily Dickinson in this story, <laughs> and it happened in England. It didn't happen here. What's going on? At which point you say, this is a new adaptation, because it is an adaptation. And you say, this is what's going to make it new and interesting. Right? And then if they ask you any more information, because this is just the top of the page, lower down when you're putting down notes or production notes, you can say, I know the 19th century New England town, it's Northampton, Massachusetts. It is set up in such a way that all the major scenes can be played without changing a thing. 
including the old railroad station. And by the way, I've been uh, talking to somebody at the Chamber of Commerce, and they said, we'd love to have a movie made here. Makes it much more welcome, right? So if you do a little research and you figure these things out, it makes it, it, it allows a producer or director to be much more open to your idea, right? You'll then, you know, Google that shit and find, you know, what the town looks like and, oh yeah, the whole Main Street and everything. And there's this and there's that and there's churches, there's old buildings. Looks perfect. We don't have to build a set at all. We're saving money. Right? So, picturesque New England town, two brothers and their friends, we're laying out who the people are in this movie from the beginning. Two brothers. We're not saying, you know, what happens to them. The two brothers and their friends, and then this other person, the American poet, Emily Dickinson, battle a powerful demonologist. So we have our good guys, and we have our antagonists. The demonologist, because they're battling this demonologist, who controls and kills using the spell of ancient Icelandic runes. That's new and different. I've never seen a movie where somebody opens something up and a room comes up and sets up a whole chain of circumstances. Okay. So this is what a log line is like with a log on a page. This is a fake proposal, isn't it, or is it? Say what? Is this a fake proposal? It's not a fake proposal. Somebody's got an option on this. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody actually took out an option on that one. Is it a new adaptation of Scooby-Doo? Because it kind of sounds. I'm sorry. Is it a new adaptation of Scooby-Doo? <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine what that long line page looked yeah. like? <laughs> I mean, yeah. I've seen some real stunners in my time. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you mentioned production notes further down. Are they further down on the log line page, or are they somewhere else? This is the first thing you write okay. when you, you can write a screenplay, you can write an introduction, you can write all kinds of stuff. But if you are, if you want to get your movie made, the first thing you do is a log line page. And generally it's a fuller page than that because you want to give them more information. Uh, you know, Johnny Depp said he played the team in all the <laughs> <laughs> or you can say there are two plum roles here for established actors. Johnny Depp is the demonologist and Jodie Foster as the poet. <laughs> that means they can call up Jodie Foster's agent and say, hey, we got an interesting script for you. Right? I mean, that's the way these things get done. Right? So this is the first thing you see. Has anyone ever heard of an uh, organization called the Writers Guild of America? Yeah. Okay. Do we know what that is? It's a group of people who write for TV and film. They are wonderful writers. I've never met a better group of people. They are so protective of you. But what they want is they want you to register your log line or your proposal or your script with them for the cost of $20 online and they can say, they can protect it then once it's there, right? And you just, you can do it online, you know? You can't necessarily protect the title, but, but this logline genre and that log, that's protected. That was filed there several years ago, and if anything comes in and somebody says, wait a minute, that sounds like, they'll do it. The other good use of, the, uh, of, of having a page like that is that um, directors and producers will make a certain series of movies and then say, well, it's time to make a horror movie. Why don't you call up the Writers Guild of America and have them send you over the log line, to one page, log line of all the horror movies that have not been made. And they'll send over 45 of them, 50 of them, whatever. And the intern or the assistant to the director or producer goes through them and picks out the one that they like best. That does happen. And um, if the movie gets made or there's a portion of it being made, it's stopped for whatever reason, they will get you, the uh, Rise of America, will get you your money back. I worked with a film director who died 
and whose um, estate was in contention for what was it, 18 years or something like that. They got me the rest of the money that was owed. So, I mean, they're really good at it. You know? But this is the first thing you have to do. This is the first thing that anybody sees. So it's important, yes. Do you have to have a complete script behind it? You do not have to have a complete script. You have to have this. So you can, on the rest of the page, this is about half the page, on the rest of the page you can say whatever else you want to say about it that's going to make it interesting or attractive or new or, you know, if you have a brother-in-law who is a cinematographer, I would put in there somewhere. My brother-in-law, the cinematographer, said he'd love to shoot this movie. You know, the log lines or log line pages are very important. It's your introduction, right? And then after that is, you know, what you do after that is what's happening. Here is a page from a different one. The title is Universal Donor. The Writers Guild of America registration number. It's pretty clear that from most of the people that you're going to be doing actual legal, honest business, that they would love to see a registration number from the WGA. Because that means it's passed one test already. And it is legal and honest and whatever. When I first did my first script, Part of my contract, I'm sorry, going back to the next subject, part of my first contract was they were going to pay my WGA fees and my sign up fee. Right? They were going to pay it. That was right in the contract. Right? So, and they have terrific medical coverage and whatever, whatever. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. I mean, it really is the go to place. So, could anyone right. become a member of the WGA? Anyone can become a member, but it takes a certain series of steps to do it. If you have plenty of money and you want to join them and pay your initial fee, they'd be happy to let you in. Right? Um, generally speaking, they don't cover you medically until you have actually done something, completed something or work, or somebody's optioned it or bought it or something. And at that point, you get about five years coverage per year of the <laughs> medical coverage. Good medical coverage. It's the act that the Screen Actors Guild is like that. Uh, Directors Guild is like that. Producers Guild. They're very, very serious you know, unions, and that's what they are. OK, so let's look at this. The first thing is fade in, right? So that opens the movie, right? Interior, a West Hollywood apartment, night, rain. That tells you what it is, right? That says, okay, this is your set, and this is the time of day. Okay? If it were that historical one we were talking about, I might write 18, May of 1868 or May of 1882. Get the year as close to that you want so that their customers and the people who do their sets can Google it and find out what stuff looked like then. Right? Okay. So very clearly. And then you say, here's your description. This is not a big long description. A small, modest living room, two windows prominent. This is like a stage play, right? Behind the sofa where Lynn Barrett Laborde sits <laughs> reading, mark, marking, and taking notes. So you have a setting, and you have action. Right now, it could be a screenplay. Right? It could be a stage play. It could be a TV play. Right? Above the sound of the rain, we hear three sharp knocks in the window. Now, why did that writer say, above the sound of the rain? He's cueing in the sound person who's got to do the sound. So we've got the rain going on, and then there are going to be these louder knocks on the window. Right? A lot of times, it's gotten to the point, I'm almost, I almost horrify myself 
but I'll get to a point where I'm watching a movie and say to myself, oh gee, they must have done about five sound places to get this combination of sounds, right? Because it's not normal. Most of what you're saying really is not normal. There was a movie out last year called Roma, a fabulous movie, oh, yeah. and there's, which had terrific sound, mm -hmm. terrific sound, and really complex sound. And then at one moment, she's going into the ocean, to, the nursemaid is going into the ocean to save the children who might be drowning, and you get this enormous sound of the ocean mm -hmm. because it's her first time doing it. Mm -hmm. All other sound is going away. It was such a brilliant use of sound there. You were with her close up, going in wave after wave, and you were hearing each one of them magnified terrifically. So a screenplay really does tell what's going on, who's got to do what, what the lighting is, what the scene has to look like, how if, if she were dressed differently for a particular reason, you would have to say so. A lot of information is conveyed. Okay, Lynn jumps, startled out of her reading. Right? That's just action. Lynn leans over and clears the mist from the window to look out. So somebody had to put mist on that window. <laughs> right? If you're in a studio and you shoot in, there's no normal mist. Somebody's got to put the mist on the window. Right? So you're cueing the stage director to get mist on the window. A leather jacket is lower on, taps the window again. It belongs to Byron Scotty. Anytime you introduce a new character in a screenplay, always capital letters. You don't necessarily have to describe them. Unlike a stage play, which has its list of characters, you don't necessarily have to have that. The action or the dialogue will tell you who these people are, but always put them in capital letters. Lynn withdraws from the window and opens it an inch, action again. First piece of dialogue, Byron. Janice, it's Byron, open up. Janice, what Janice? This is Lynn. We've just been told this is Lynn, right? So you've already set up something. And that actually is the catalyst. It happened on the first page, after the first page, right? So Byron is knocking on the window looking for Janice and expect him to get in. So screenplays are almost like a series of uh, signals to various people who will be involved in making it. To the actors, to the directors, to the producers, to the various people who are making it. And so you have to think about it as much, you have to visualize it as much as possible when you're starting right now. Questions? Yes. Could you speak a little bit to the typographical layout there? The, uh, Say that left, again. Speak a little to the typographic layout there, the left okay. justified This is called in. Final Draft. It's a particular uh, font. It's very readable. It uh, has been used for years in Hollywood. It began with typewriters at MGM. <laughs> this is a typewriter font. You go back to 1927, 1928, and that's all the, the Remingtons were using that font. That was a basic font. So nowadays, that has been um, adapted by the film industry, by the TV industry. What's good about it is that it's very clear. And it is uh, sans serif, but it's very readable. Mm -hmm. And you can always tell uh, capital letters what's going on. Okay. So that's why it's, that's why it's used. There is also some. There is now. There are all kinds of uh, screenwriting uh, uh, apparatus for your computer programs. The basic one is called Final Draft, and it's expensive. But it, well, once you have it, you have it. You know. They periodically update it, but I'm using number five, and I think they're up to number ten by now. And nobody says, oh, you're using it all for the crap. And what's wonderful about it is that from the very beginning, it sets up whether you're doing 
a regular screenplay, a television pilot or television episode, or a stage play. It lays it all out for you. And once you do the first page, it's like a little machine. And it copies it over and over again. So you don't have to write, you know, all you have to do is Byron, and it puts it in the middle, it knows who it is, sets it up. So it's really a wonderful thing to work with. Um, and I recommend it if you get serious about doing screenplays. So the final draft, it's called. Questions, more questions? So it actually is 10 minutes. How long do we have here? Are we till 2.30 or what? I think 2.15. Say what? I think 2.15. 2.15, we're very yeah. close to that. Um, so last words, Hollywood is this new place of glamour. It's a working place and now all over the world. And it really is, I mean, obviously here in, in uh, New Orleans, there's been delayed to go with it. But it really is all over. And you may wake up. Uh, at three in the morning, and suddenly there are big lights in your window because they are like, what's happened today when I was living in the West Village in Manhattan? And certainly in Los Angeles, they're filming all over the world because they can do it with mobile sets now.